I um, I don't know what what's in your head when you think about coming to church. I, I don't know what you're, what you think you're in for. <laughs> um, whatever it may be, can we, let's just take a minute and let's just try to clear that out of, of our minds, and just invite the Holy Spirit. Um, we were talking th- this this morning again, and and I don't want our goal to be to recreate a feeling, a mood, a time period, an experience. I, I, I just don't want us to, to be pressured to try to make this time look like any sort of thing, feel like any sort of thing, work like any sort of thing, um, but just allow the Lord to be here and to do what he would do. You come, Lord. We've, we've heard the stories. We've experienced salvation. We've heard of your great deeds and... and Father, we believe would help our unbelief. Father, we, we know that we've tasted and seen that it's good, and Father, we want more. You can come as you want to, Father. Come as fire, come as a wind, come as a still small voice. You come through conviction, come through passion. You can come, Father. So uh, Amy does have this habit. Did she just walk out? Yeah. A- Amy has this, this habit of uh, somehow summing up the sermon before <laughs> I get to it. Um, so if you heard what Amy said, this may sound a little bit redundant, but I'm going to take a <laughs> I'm going to take some time to get there. So uh, she gave you the, the, the Reader's Digest version. Um, Hebrews 9 has, has this passage. When, when Brant spoke a few weeks ago, he, he read this to us, and, um, and it, it did pique my interest, of course. I've read it many times, but, but something kind of jumped off the page. Uh, this is in Hebrews 9. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar of incense, the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded in the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the, uh, were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. But, as I have a slide, we can. <laughs> I'm the pastor and I got some time. So, <laughs> we're able to do this. Um, there's some necessary background that we have to have because, I, again, I don't think we're very familiar with the temple and its kind of layout and its structure and all these things. So I, I pulled up uh, some of my favorite theologians and I listened to some of my favorite pastors talking about. Um, you can go back to the other slide, not not this one yet. <laughs> but um, I I, uh, I I I listened to some of these great great speakers. And I fell asleep. <laughs> I kid you not. It, they, they just went on about the, the symbolism and what this meant then and now. And, and I, I conked out. I don't know if it was a longer day at work or whatever. And, and you know, and I, I give you that as grace. All right. Sometimes I know that this stuff can be a little bit meaty, a little bit hard, and, and if you fall asleep, I won't take it personally. Um, that's not my, my goal. I, 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 this is, it's actually, I didn't plan on saying all this beforehand, of course, too, about what church can be. But when we talk about the table and not the pulpit being central, it, I, this isn't a lecture hall. You know, th- th- this isn't meant to teach you things that are going to be stored in your memory bank that, you know, you will just use to further talk about church things with church people. Like, that, that, that's not the point of this stuff. But there is a, a, there's a model, and there's a reason for that model, and it, and it helps us to break through from maybe what we understand to what can be, to life as it's meant to be lived. Because if you're like me, you know, you, you've probably tasted and seen what this world has to offer. And you just realize it's pretty shallow. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's really not sufficient. You know, like, like it, what, uh, there was a tweet that I read that I think went viral where it was like, so wait a minute, is this it? I'm supposed to like work my job, drink coffee and eat dinner out on Fridays, like <laughs> until I die? Like that's my life? I, like, no, no, it's not. <laughs> and I, I think that that's kind of the, the wake up call to us. That, and that's what, what the church is really about. It, that, 
my goodness, no. You're, you're missing the beauty. You're missing life. You're missing the fellowship. You're, you're missing the whole intent of this whole thing if you think that that's the entirety of it. And, and though if in the faith, if we reduce it from the power and presence of God, if we just make it about these facts and figures, if we just make it about knowing certain things, I'm bored. <laughs> and I will fall asleep and I won't even feel guilty about it, right? So I, I listen to those. And, and the thing is, you can read these things in a Bible study and you just go, huh. And you move on to the next, right? We've done it. <laughs> if you've read Numbers, God bless you. If you've read Leviticus, God bless you. And if you haven't, God bless you. Um, but you know, there's these portions where there's, there's no plot, where there's, an, you, you know, you feel like no relevance, no application. There's lists of names and these things. <laughs> no car chases. There's no bank heists. What are we supposed to do? Um, but what we want to talk about this morning, what I want to talk about is this thing called the showbread. Um, he, it was in that, that passage where he says, you know, we, we can't talk about these things right now, but, but we actually, there's something to it. Showbread, such a weird term. The guy who first translated the Bible, uh, Tyndall, he, he gave us this, this phrase. He just kind of made it up. <laughs> uh, it's not the best name for it. But there's these 30 second gifts. Now you got the next slide here. Uh, there's these little gifts. If you've seen them on the internet, they're fascinating things. There's this guy, I looked up his name, uh, Amori Gushon, which I am probably saying wrong, but you might have seen these little videos or, or gifts that he has. Th he's this amazing chocolatier. Everything you see in there, except for the guy, is edible. <laughs> right? He just makes these things out of chocolate and cake and nuts and, and everything, and they're amazingly lifelike. And if you watch these gifts, what you'll see is that, that he, he goes ahead, he makes this clock, like you see there, and then at the very like final five seconds, he cuts it open and eats it. And I, I just think you spent eight hours making this thing for one bite. Like, <laughs> and there's this part of me that feels like you should slow down. Just like, like you've made this thing show it off, which is, I guess, exactly why it's on the internet because he actually is showing it off. That point aside, right? You spent all this time making something amazingly intricate and beautiful, and, and it's just, it's, it's gone. It's food. And I think the term showbread almost gives us that impression. It's just for show. You know, it, it's, just, it's just something there for appearance sake. You know, it, it's something that we have a, as a symbol that we put up before everybody. You can look at it, you can point at it, you can see it. And that's kind of the extent of it. And I, I think that the, the term showbread kind of creates this impression for us. If, if you know me at all, I'm a word guy. Like the, the words that we use, I think have great meaning because it, it does, it, it, it tends to lead our thoughts in a certain direction. So I don't really love the term showbread, but there's other, other phrases for it. Um, after showbread, the, there's actually shoebread. This is on the next slide. Yep. Um, the actual literal translation of it is bread of faces, which is kind of freaky. I'm not sure I like my bread to have a face. So let's not use that one. My, my favorite translation of this is the bread of presence. Now that one, I kind of get behind. And, and, and that's offered to us in a number of translations these days. And, and it kind of helps us understand what this bread is actually about. Um, let me give you a quick aside. We're talking about this bread, right, which is, is done. I, I kind of ripped on the chocolate guy a little bit. Um, let me tell you, beauty has an, an, an intricate purpose all on its own. All right. We get so consumed sometimes, I think about function, and we think of bread. Bread is meant for eating, right? You know, so, so all the sorts of like, why have a chocolatier that can make an eight-foot giraffe? That's one of the things that he's done, right? Because really, it, it's just meant to be eaten at the end of it. And we get so concerned with function that I think we forsake what beauty is actually about. And beauty, intricate beauty, is all around us. And it's there, and it, and it celebrates life in a way that, that, that function cannot. And they're not enemies, all right? It's not function or beauty. Like, like when the Lord created this world, it is beautiful and fully functional. And, in, and we can't seem to hold those things very well at the same time. You know, I, we can make a tool that does its job very well, or we have this beautiful ornate thing that doesn't really do the job too well. And we kind of struggle with that back and forth. But if you think about the temple, the temple wasn't just function. The temple was intricate. It was, it was ordained. It, it, was, it was gilded. It was, it was beautiful to look at. It was a, a, a wonder of the world. And can you imagine if they said, you know what? 
a, a Weber grill will do just fine. Like, like yeah, we got these sacrifices to do. Just bring me a Weber. You know, and, and there's these, these golden cups that you put on this table. We, we ran out of gold. Just get me some of those red silo cups that, that we had <laughs> from the barbecue, and, and we're just going to put those on the middle of the right. And, and you would come to that table, you'd look at it, and it would be like a barbecue at my house, and you would think, yeah, okay, I mean, I guess we're going casual here, you know? Beauty has its purpose. And it's not elit elitism as we tend to think about it. I think that in, in America, we often think of these gilded things as, as just being, oh, that's, that's like the, the upper class. You know, the, they have the money to spend on, on these things. And it's really not that. I, I love watching, you know, the, these, these, these people who are just artisans, who just spend their time whittling or making a sign or just, just taking their, their time and this attention to detail. And it's an investment not so much of, of anything except their skill and, and time on making something beautiful. And it's wonderful and it's precious because it's, it's part of you. I, I've, I've made something that's not just about, you know, accomplishing some task. It's beautiful and it's meant to be beautiful. The way that we see things in, in our modern world though is that the more beautiful something is, the more valuable it is and often the less it's meant to be used, the less able to perform its function is. I'm a, I'm a dad of girls. Um, do you know how many pounds of glitter we've gone through in my house? <laughs> I don't know. I legitimately don't know how many pounds, but I'm sure it's in pounds. And I hate glitter. Like with a, a passion, I hate glitter because it just gets everywhere. But the thing is, Eva in particular thinks it's the most beautiful thing ever, all right? Because it sparkles, you know, and it's there. I was, uh, I was actually uh, Thursday night. This is so my daughters are kind of out of the glitter stage, but not fully. But but I'm there in my in my be my bedroom, okay? My bedroom. I don't know why I was on the floor, but I think I was maybe petting the dog or grabbing something, I don't know. And there was a hard glue ball of glitter in my carpet. And I didn't know what it was at first, so I, I kind of picked it up and like, you know, squeezed it a little bit and then it glitter everywhere and i'm just like really again and then it got on my computer screen so when i'm working on my sermon there's like glitter now on there and the keyboard and i'm just like this is my life this is gonna be my life for like the next 20 years and and you know it's gonna keep coming that i just get glitter <laughs> so for the rest of my life and what i love about being a dad of girls is i don't think they really need to be taught this lesson at least mine didn't right Things are made beautiful just because they should be. You're, 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 you, you color the walls, literally color the walls. Why? Because the wall needed color, right? Because it's better with glitter. Because there should be a face on this thing, because, and it should be a smiley face. So, so my life has been literally colored in by my kids, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but anyway, th th this, this, this term we're talking about, showbread, which I think creates this impression that we just look at it and we just appreciate it from a distance, is probably best understood uh, a bread of presence. And this is a constant theme, as we've already said through this whole series, right? The, the, the temple is a place where God wants to be with his people. That, like that, that's the desire. His presence is meant to be with his people. God was never meant to be put on a shelf and be made irrelevant. You know, he wasn't meant to just be something that we talked about in, in theory and, and in concepts, but we don't actually do anything about it. He is a God of presence. Like from, from the garden to the end, his, his whole point is come close. And if you can't come close, here's how you wash. Here, here's how you make yourself pure. Here's what you need to do to know that you can come close. I'm going to build my house right in the middle. Why? So I can be with you. I'm going to make a garden. But you know what? This temple, that's not my ideal because I want it to be where we're just freely with each other. The picture of heaven. You know what? My son, he's going to come. He's going to live with you. And after he, that doesn't work, you know, after he has a life and he dies, then guess what? My church is going to be living stones and my temple will be his, my people themselves. This is Ephesians 2. So then you are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. This, this is the plan. 
And it's, it's, he's not secretive about it. <laughs> that this isn't like the plan B. This isn't like if everything else fails. This isn't like, well, if the Holy Spirit's not enough for you. Like, this is the plan. This is what he wanted to do and what he's been actively doing. When you were at your worst, when you're the furthest away, he was calling and whispering and aligning things, getting you to come back so you can be in his presence. That's been the idea this whole time. So the showbread meant to be the bread of presence. I, I want to talk a little bit about how it was prepared very, very briefly. Like I said, don't fall asleep on me yet. Literally just three statements. Um, it was made by special bakers with the best flour. There was different reports on, on what it looked like and how it was prepared, but, but uh, we see in, in 1 Chronicles 9.32, also some of their kinsmen of the Kohathites had charge of the showbread to prepare it every Sabbath. So they're special people, they had a special recipe, and they made this thing, and it was out there for a week, all right? But they had to bake it so quickly that there could be no leaven and no rise in the bread. So they, they, they had these special bakers, they made this bread once a week, they brought it into the temple, and they brought the old stuff out. That was the idea of it. So that's all the, that I've got about the preparation. I think that's what I fell asleep during all the sermons I was listening to. So if you made it through that, you're doing great. Uh, biblical text on this, Exodus 25. This is the table. Make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make around it a rim, a hand breadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. Make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, and carry the table with them. Make its plates and dishes of pure gold, as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of the offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. I mean, if you got anything from that, it's gold, <laughs> right? It's gold throughout with gold stuff on top. It is a precious, precious thing. I love our table. Imagine if it was just covered in gold and there's always meant to be bread on it, always. The, just always before the presence of God, always before the people, always before the priest, there's that smell of fresh bread. There was a, a bakery in Chicago that got sued because it was making everything smell like fresh bread. <laughs> Sometimes I don't understand people. <laughs> but but th just imagine that this idea that, that there's always fresh bread available on this golden table, and we're starting to see it. Leviticus 24 the Lord said to Moses, command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning continually. Outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant law and the tent of meeting, Aaron is to tend the lamps before the Lord from evening till morning continually. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord must be tended continually. Take the finest flour and bake 12 loaves of bread using two tenths of an ephah of, for each loaf. Arrange them in two stacks, six in each stack, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. By each stack put some pure incense as a memorial portion to represent the bread and to be a food offering presented to the Lord. The bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. It belongs to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in the sanctuary area because it is a most holy part of the perpetual share of the food offerings presented to the Lord. So this is kind of what it looks like. God is a little Spartan in his design, right? I've, I've got a picture here too of, of the next thing. They don't actually know what this table looked like for sure. I kind of like the one on, on the left where they actually had these large things for the loaves of bread and they were kind of stacked up on those. Some people think it looked like that. Other people think it was just like the golden table there where they just kind of stack the bread up in the, these sixes. We don't really know and there, there's debate about it. It doesn't really matter. I just want you to know it was beautiful and it was there, like, if God has a foyer, he's got a lamp and a table of bread. Like, that, that's like it. And that's kind of a, a, a telling thing. Like, this, if, if God were to set up anything, if he was going to have a treasury, you know, or, or if he was like a warrior God where he had, like, the, the history of all that stuff there, like, what do you think God would put there so that when you're coming close to him, he wants you to see? He sets up a light so you can see, <laughs> and there's a table of bread. Like, that feels really significant, does it not? Like, of, of all the things that could be in there, I mean, we're not going to go into the Holy of Holies right now where the temple's corn and, and we get to, to go through there all that now, but, but before that time when that was torn, this is what we had there. 
And it's, it's amazing, really, to realize that this is the intent of it, or the extent of it. So I want to highlight this, too. Why, why leave it out for a whole week, from Sabbath to Sabbath, right? Uh, I, I kind of think it's an important question. You know, the, the plan was that there's always bread at the temple, and there was this food that the priests would eat, but they couldn't eat it while it was being presented before the, the Lord. It wasn't there until they brought out the next loaf that they would take the, the bread that's been out for a week. And why would they do it that way? Why, why has it got to be that this, this week old bread, you know, and, and you can look at this with a very broken way of thinking like we talked about last week and just say like, oh, you know, God's just trying to keep us in our place. You know, keep it for him until it goes stale and moldy and then, then he's going to hand it off to the priests. And that's such a, a broken way, I think, of understanding this stuff. The Levites were in service, right? That God comes first. And there's a beautiful humility in always remembering the order of these things. That the Son of Man, Jesus tells us, came, what? To be served? No, but to serve. And, and it's a profound thing when we realize that this is the, the plan again. This is the goal. This is what it's meant to look like, that, that there's actual glorification and service. And when you look at the way that this looks across ancient religions and, and, and the Egyptian priesthoods that, that they had for their gods and the way that, that the church today even exalts pastors often, there's a problem. There's a brokenness that is ugly and narcissistic, that, that it goes to promote power, that it goes to promote the glory, that, that it, it's not that the, those who are being the service to all, it's that, you know, you must serve us, you must serve me. And it is such a terrible way of thinking. I think that God built into this system a beautiful way that the priests were not meant to be the power players throughout the Israelite culture. That wasn't the idea. So yes, they, they're the priesthood. Yes, they're those who spend their time before the Lord. Yes, they don't have fields and flocks. They can't tend to themselves. And people are bringing them food that they get to eat. But guess what? It goes to the Lord first. They are not those who are in charge. They are those who, are, who serve. Those are, they are those who stand in the gap. That's the picture of Christ-like leadership that we should still have today. You know, like we, we talk about this, um, maybe not enough. But my, my job here is to serve you all. <laughs> That's it. That's my job description. If you need help, call me, right? If you need, need service, let us know how we can help you. It, it's not that you come and fill in these gaps. It's not that you come and try to uh, make these things so that our church looks so great and all these sorts of things. No, I serve you. That's, that's, that's what I signed up for. That's what I want to do. And if I can do it through teaching, God bless it, because that's something I think I can do. If I can do it through watching kids, through bringing groceries, God bless it, that's what I'll do. All right? That's the picture on how the church is meant to work. Not this thing where the priests are, are accumulating power, and they take the money, and they take all this food, and then they, they wield it out, and they, they have this, this control over the people. That's brokenness. So I think by having this weak old bread, it's not, it's not killing the Levites, but it is reminding them. I think it's a good way to keep things in check and to know who we are. We're not fleecing people. It's not rules for thee, but not for me. And I want to say this too. God's just never in a hurry. He's just never in a hurry. We are always in a hurry. You know, you smell the bread and you start salivating and you're just thinking, oh, here it comes. You're right. And, and we get excited and we get in a hurry and then we gorge ourselves and it's this, you know, and, and, and we have this habit of just rushing from one thing to the next. As soon as it's ready, we do this. There's, there's a, a rhythm to this, which kind of slows you down. And I see in that the hand of God, Right. How many times do we just feel the rush? As soon as something's ready, you got to move. As, as it comes out of the oven, put it out there and make it smoke. Make sure we're, we're taking things well. No, there, there's a, a rhythm to this, which is just not hurried. And, it, and it's, not, it's not bad. It's not wrong. It's just, it's just different than the way we would do things if we were setting this up ourselves, right? And there's something in that that is so respectable, something in that that just tells me that God is in control. God's got this. So this passage about the bread and the lampstand in the Hebrews really jumped out to me because as you all know, right, we are trying to keep the table central, not the pulpit. And we've done that very literally, very physically. We, we talk about it a lot. This is something that I think the Lord has called our church to understand. 
Do you notice that there's no pulpit in the Holy of Holies? There's no megaphone there for, for them to just shout out the, the, these things. That's not what there was. But what do we have in the temple? The table. What's close to God? A, a microphone for the priests to, to get their message out? Their understanding on what the Lord was saying? Or a place to come to the table? A place where he's invited us. He wasn't a minimalist decorator, but, but it was as beautifully ornate with all the few things that there are, this table full of bread. Here with the eternal God who does not hunger or thirst or sleep, right in front of his presence, there's bread. God doesn't eat bread. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> I mean, Jesus did. But the Father doesn't eat bread. Like they would leave it out for a week. It's not like fire came down from heaven and consumed it and you would say, oh look, God ate his bread. You know, now we've got to feed him again. That wasn't the plan. That's not the idea. God, though, told us to bring bread into the temple continually as an offering to him. It, it, come on, y'all. That's kind of strange, right? You can, you can see why is it bread? Why is it, why does he put bread so close to his presence? I think we always had this temptation to reduce the entirety of, of the gospel to like some pithy staying. And, and, and I, I found one on this. Uh, Jesus came not to give bread, but to be bread. It's pretty witty. <laughs> you got to give credit to that pastor. Um, and I think, though, about the manna. And I think about the bread of presence. And I think about the feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000, you know. And it's both. He came to give bread and to be bread. And that they're kind of one and the same as it's the heartbeat of God as he's trying to get at us however we can learn this lesson. Like, it, do, I, do I feed you literally so that you understand what I'm trying to talk about for your souls? Do I, do, I, do I make sure that your stomach is not in the way that you understand that I will take care of you, that you are my children, that you're welcome to this table that I'm going to set for you, that, that when we have the banquet, that you are all welcome here? How do I do this? He came to give bread and to be bread. In one of those sermons, I read this. He did not come to be useful, but to be precious. And this kind of goes into what I, I said earlier about beauty having its own purpose. He didn't come to be useful, but to be precious. And we know about the, if you don't know, the, the, the feeding of the multitudes. Amazing story where Jesus came. He took just a, a few loaves and fish, and he broke it, and he fed 5,000 people that were gathered to hear him speak. And he had 12 baskets left over. It's an amazing testament about how God could provide for his people through all this. The disciples didn't know how it was happening. They were gathering this stuff. It's this amazing thing. But after he did that, after he fed the multitudes, they saw this miracle and they fixated on the product of the miracle, not the person of the miracle. And Jesus answered the next day, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. We got so fixated on the bread that he gave them that they, they were forgetting the who. They were mistaking the why. It, it was all about, again, the, the, this idea of function rather than the beauty of who he was. Fill me again, Jesus. You know, like, like take care of me. Serve me. This whole idea, again, about putting ourselves central, trying to make it about what we can profit from this, uh, making it about what we can get from this and, and bread and what it can do for us, what it's going to save for us. Verse 15, where we have that feeding the multitude, says this. Perceiving that they were about to come and, to, and make him by, take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. They didn't see him as precious. They weren't listening to him. They weren't treating him with the respect of the king. They were saying, that guy, he's going to be the king that I want. He's going to take care of me the way that I want to be taken care of. They weren't even listening to his own words. They weren't listening to what he, how he wanted to rule, how he was meant to, to do things, that the order of things, that how it is meant to go, they just thought, more of that, please. You can do miracles, and I want miracles, so therefore you're going to be my king. They saw his gifts as precious. What a useful king he will be. Let's have Jesus be our king. He'll keep our bellies full. And I think we do the same thing still. We are not so mature. <laughs> We're not so much better. We want what the Lord's going to give us. And he gives good gifts. And I think it's amazing that God's character, his method, 
somehow isn't full of judgment and skepticism and cynicism and hatred toward, towards us and frustration towards us. Because when he acts, when he moves, he has this beautiful, amazing way of being unconcerned with anything but the moment. Like when he comes into a room, when he's present in worship, whenever he speaks and leads or whatever he does, you have just this way of just knowing he's got this. His, he's good. I belong here. He has this way of providing and preparing. And we, we can't handle that. <laughs> like if you provide for me, then, then you're, if, or what, what do people say? If, if you just give people stuff all the time, they're never going to learn how to take care of themselves. So like, you know, our, our, it's like our, our caring for the poor is always kind of measured in wisdom because it's like, well, we don't want to give too much, you know, because we got to kind of hold off a little bit so that they meet us halfway. And we, we, we do that. Jesus didn't do that. He had this unconcerned way that somehow worked where people were prepared and provided for. And I think when he is central, when he is the Lord of all, that's how it works. But if we come forward in our own wisdom, if we think the bread is, he's not going to eat the bread anyway. You know, it's, it's, it's just going to sit there for seven days while it's getting old and stale. Like, I might as well just eat that bread myself. You know, we have this way of, of, of trying to take these things and make them make sense by our order of things. But when he's God, he's not just functional, but he's precious. The ornate table to hold bread, the ornate lamp that's always tended to, those aren't just facts. They're a testimony. And this, this is actually, I think, really important to realize that that lamp, that table of bread, it's not just a detail about the temple. It's a testimony. And I mean that very literally. It's a testimony. It's a, it bears witness. It's a witness to his presence. It's a witness to his heart. It's a witness to his value. It's a witness to his intent. The fact that this is what he says, I want you to see about me, right? That there's bread here for, for people. <laughs> I, I want you to see that, that even though I don't eat bread, I have bread for you. I, I, I want you to be able to come close. I, I, this, this is the plan. This is the idea. And it's not just generic bread out there. This is my bread. This, this, is, this is close to me. I'm feeding you from my own house. So you can go from, from there with something that was in my presence. Bread isn't just food. It's not just survival. It, it's, it's identity. There's history there. There's a personal touch. There's preparation. There's a joy to somebody enjoying my food. If I smoke a pork butt for you and you come and you enjoy it alongside me, I can't explain to you why, but I care what you think. You know what I mean? Like if, 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 if I burn it and you're like, oh, Josh, this is really kind of nasty and you, you pick at it and you turn it over, like there's a part of my soul that kind of withers up a little bit. I'm just like, oh, why? It's just food. I make mistakes, right? But do you know what I'm talking about? There's something that I've put into this meal that, that I want to delight you. It, it, it's, it's not just calories. You like the burn pieces. We'll get it all in the face, right? But there's something we put into this. Hospitality is rich because you're invested, not, not this, this thing that you've made, but you yourself are invested in this thing. It's, it's maybe one of the most intimate things we can do. It's beautifully important. And making meals, opening up our tables, having the table central, it's sharing who we are. It's so important. It's so important. If you try kiffles, do you know what kiffles are? The bread of my people. Slovaks are not known for many dishes. Included amongst that are kiffles, because we're not well known for kiffles. But it's a pastry. You wrap it up with some fruit. You got some that are filled with some nut spread. And, and, and it's like one of the things from my childhood. Again, Slovaks, we're not known for many things. But if, if we order kiffles once a year, and, and I'll eat them very quickly. But if you come to my house at the right time, you don't have to get the lekvar, the prune ones. You can actually get the good apricot ones. And if you eat my, 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 my apricot kiffle, and if you enjoy it, I feel close to you. It, I, this is truth, right? Because it, it's, it's, the, it's like what my grandparents made. It, it, it's, it's the story of my people. And, and you're coming into my house and you're going to share this with me. And, and, you know, and I, could, I can only get them around Christmas time. There's like literally, this is not a, an exaggeration. There's like four old grandmothers in Pennsylvania still making kiffles. I don't know what's going to happen whenever they're no longer with us. I'm afraid that the kiffle kitchen... 
KiffleKitchen.com. I'm afraid Kiffle Kitchen <laughs> is going to have to shut down because nobody else knows how to make kiffles. And it is a tragedy because what are we going to do, y'all? We need to think ahead. All right, so Leah, when we are dating, let it be known that she's not really into sharing food off of her plate. Okay, if you know Leah, this is probably not a surprise to you. Food off her plate, she can almost kind of get to, but it was drinking after somebody else. Like, you know, you don't, you just don't do that. That's just <laughs> gross. I could tell when she became a mother in a whole other level, whenever her kids would, would drink from a cup and then she would just, whatever, and just, <laughs> and just drink it. Maybe with the floaties, you know? The floaties you can kind of understand, but the sinkers, those are, that was the problem that you would have. So Leah really reached a new threshold of intimacy when it was feeding her kids off of her own plate and out of her own cup. My parents on their honeymoon went to Hawaii and I, I laugh at this story because my mom ordered some ice cream, like the really crazy, you know, things you can't get on the mainland, that sort of thing. My dad got like vanilla. <laughs> she hated her ice cream. And so she asked my dad for some of his and he said, no. <laughs> so on their honeymoon, they have this terrible fight. My mom storms off down the beach. My dad goes back to the hotel. And he says, it's an island. She'll come back eventually. <laughs> True story. But I find it so funny because, you know, it's this intimacy, right? To, to share my food, to share my drink off my own plate is way more intimate than going to the store and popping up, open something, and, and we just kind of have it together. There's this idea of a copy versus the original, right? If, if you go to see a moon rock and somebody puts it in your hand, and they say, well, this isn't the actual moon rock, I feel kind of like cheated. Like, oh my goodness, I thought this came from the moon. Well, it looks just like it. It's made out of the same stuff. It, it's not the same. I want a moon uh, rock, uh, something that came from the moon that I can touch and hold in my hands. I found a coin in my parents' car once, pieces of eight, and I was, I had no idea where this came from, and I, and I grabbed it. It was like precious to me, and then like after a few years, like I pulled it out, I looked and it says on it, replica, <laughs> and I have no idea where it came from. I don't know if it's the people that owned the car before me. I felt so, I, I hated that coin. Like I, I felt so cheated that this was a fake thing. I think I threw it away, just like completely done with this thing that, that's just lying to me. Even me and fake flowers, exactly. Same, same concept here. It's one thing to go to England and to be told this is the queen's favorite dish and we followed her, her recipe from her kitchen to a tea, right? That's, a, that's cool. But imagine the queen herself said, hey, this is my favorite dish. Let me, let me feed you from my plate. Oh my goodness. Like, can you even imagine? Can you imagine the queen of England feeding you off of her plate? It's laughable. The showbread, the bread of presents, you see what the Lord's doing? I'm going to feed you off my own plate. <laughs> this is the table that's in my house. This is the table of food that was given to me. And you know what? It's for my friends. This is the point. This is the intent. It's about abiding. The bread, they say, stayed fresh and hot. It didn't grow mold or go stale. The thing with food, though, just as a, as a lesson we all know, you eat today, tomorrow, you're going to eat again. <laughs> right? That's the nature of food. And that's kind of the point. It's not fix me up and let me go. Set me free and I'm going to fly away and, you know, be out on my own. The point of food is you come back to it again and again and again. It's about abiding. It's about knowing where your life comes from. It's about being centered on something that matters. It's about having that, that, that place where you know you can be taken care of, that where, you, where you pull strength from, where you pull identity from, where, where you're being taken care of. Food does that as nothing else does. Maybe oxygen as we breathe. That's it, right? We need that source of life. A focus on a pulpit is going to give us a checklist. Things to know things to understand, but a focus on the table calls us to abide, to live. 
to experience, to come back again and again and again, because that's the plan. So again, from last week, John 15, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. We are called, church, to a daily renewal, an abiding relationship, not fix me up and let me fly. The image of Christ is clearly here. It's often said that the temple with all these customs and practices are a shadow of what's to come. Jesus is holy before God. Jesus, the bread of life, is holy before God. And Jesus is now at the right hand of God, interceding. He's the bread of presence. He's the word of life. He's the bread of life. And he is in the presence of God right now, interceding for us. Do you see where that the shadow of things is, is now being realized in a more full way? That, that we had the bread of presence before, now we have Christ who is before the Father himself. He's always present. He's always present. Where two or three are in his name, he is with us. There's a bit of mystery there. But I believe when you know that, you know that. Right? It's one of those things that I, I don't know that a, a theological degree will help you to understand any better than just the practice of being in his presence and knowing the goodness. He provides true sustenance. Now this one is a bit of mystery. What, what does that even mean when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. John six thirty five. He told the woman at the well, if you drink of the living water, you won't thirst. Well, God, I've, I've, I think I'm saved. I'm still hungry. I still have to eat every day. Like, am I doing something wrong? Should I be like over food by now? Like, no. Clearly we understand he's not talking about physical food when he talks about this, right? He's not talking about our stomachs. But what if, church, I told you, you could be done with the rat race? Not done with working, but you could be done with the rat race. What if I told you that you could be done with anxiety? What if I told you you could be done with the fear of worrying if you're going to have enough? What if I, 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 I don't promise you retirement and leisure, but real contentment, full life? Would you believe that? That's the promise. Like, that's what the good news is. Like, you don't have to do this yourself. You can't earn your salvation. You, you, you can't prove your merit. You can't learn your worth. You, you can't make this thing happen with your own two hands. The idea of all of this, not metaphor. It's not a promise for one day after you die, if you're good enough and if you have all the right answers, then you can be done with the rat race. This is the promise for us here and now. That's our hope. That's our calling. It's not a carrot on a stick. It's the hope that we have of life. We see this, that Jesus is the sustenance when he hung on the cross, forgiving those who persecuted him. We see it in the empty tomb when he told them not to cling on to him. We see it on Pentecost when the spirit was poured out. Jesus sustained his people. He invited them to life beyond what we know. And my final thing here is the teaching of Christ. Mark 2. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread. The bread of presence, by the way which is lawful only for priests to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. David and his companions out on the run ate the bread from the temple. He wasn't struck dead. He was made king. He ate what was holy, what was God's own. And that was a lesson that Jesus called back to mind, saying, don't you understand? It's for people. 
The, the, the Sabbath, the bread, this is for people. I am Lord of the Sabbath. I can tell you what to do with my food. I can tell you what to do with my house. I can tell you that that curtain is going to be ripped up so that we can be one, so we can be present, so we can be together. If anything, Christ is always tearing down this wall, the wall that separates us from God, the wall that separates us from each other. He's made the holy accessible. He's made his life, his bread available for all. Our 12 loaves in the temple, was that enough for all the people? No. 12 loaves won't go that far. But what about 5,000 feeding the multitude? What about Christ himself saying, my life for you? Eat my flesh. It's real food. Drink my blood. It's real drink. That's the invitation because Jesus can multiply it. With broken bread, he can feed the multitude. I'm going to tell you again from last week, same thing, that we eat the bread of anxious toil. We eat the bread of anxious toil and we drink water and we thirst again. We're hungry and thirsty because we're still a part of this rat race. Because we're still not satisfied by him. We're still trying to satisfy ourselves. But Christ says, eat, take. This is my body. And what is more the bread of presence than Christ himself? So this was a long way of getting us to communion this morning. <laughs> but church, the table is going to be open to you. And I hope you understand, yes, the, the, the significance of this, but the freedom of this, the wonder of this, the accessibility of this, the invitation of this. This is precious. I do believe that it's the bread of presence. I, I believe that this is, this is something that is more than just a, 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 a little Christian snack. It, it's not that. Do we understand the gravity whenever we take and eat? When we take the cup and drink? To make the, the table central <coughs> is not trying to make a, a truth more relatable. It's not trying to just be more sociable. It's a call to actual more intimacy than what I think the, the, the church is comfortable with. It's answering God's hospitality of his intimacy and saying, yes. I say yes to you. So we remember on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Same way, after they'd eaten, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he said, this is my blood. The blood of the new covenant. Which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And he told us, Jesus, that whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, that we proclaim your death until you come again. Jesus, thank you for being the fulfillment of the bread of presence. Thank you for satisfying that which was only a shadow with a concrete reality that even now, Jesus, as you are on the right hand of our Father in heaven, you intercede for us, that you sustain us, you show us a more perfect way, life to the full. It's with gratitude we come to the table. We say yes to you.